Uh, let me introduce today's speaker. We're very lucky to have uh, Tom Whitley, who's uh, come down from uh, Sonoma State, uh, where he is in the Department of Anthropology and director, right, of the Anthropological Studies Center. Uh, he uh, uh, says he grew up around Germany and Netherlands on military bases, but did his BA in Washington uh, and then an MA and PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, his area of interest is uh, the leveraging, or the use, I guess I should say, of digital technologies to understand uh, past, present, and future environments. And he sees himself as kind of working the boundary between academic archaeology and uh, CRM. Uh, he has uh, published quite widely on topics around this general theme. Uh, in journals even well known to me, like Journal of Archaeological Science and the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, others, because I don't work in this area, uh, uh, series that are uh, obscure to me but seem to be focused on specifically this topic of his expertise. Uh, today he's going to talk about some of his ongoing research where he's going to touch on no fewer than three different continents. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and his talk is entitled Visualizing the Complexity of Past and Future Shoreline, uh, shoreline and Nearshore Environments Over Time. Examples from Australia, Vietnam, and California. So I'll turn things over to Tom. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, what I want to do today is I'll give you a, a brief overview of, of some of the last oh, four or five years I've been working in digital photorealistic 3D modeling of past and future environments. And I wanted to highlight three major projects that I've been working on and give you some examples. There's quite a few slides, so I'll move through some of them pretty quickly. Um, there are some videos in there as well, that some animations that can take a while. So the first, um, okay. the first uh, project I want to talk about is the Murajuga project. This is um, uh, Joe McDonald and Peter Vess's project in Northwestern Australia, and I got involved with this back in 2015. And part of my job was modeling the um, changing shoreline over time in this part of northwestern Australia. So I was dealing with a combined topographic bathymetric database um, from um, Austral Geosciences Australia. And the resolution on this database is fairly um, poor in a lot of ways, and the bath bathymetry particularly when you get into the shallow water areas. So. Um, uh, one of the things I had to do, I created a paleohydrology model to um, create what um, former stream channels would have been like before the ocean was there. And we're looking at a time frame of about 125,000 years ago until today. So I had several different model sea level curves, and I had to average between them and figure out where sea level was. And then um, what we wanted to do was model sea level change against this bathymetry and topography. The only problem is that um, the topographic um, distinction when you get less than about um, 14, 14 or 15 meters below sea level, um, the Geosciences Australia, they just um, interpolated between that sea level depth and the shoreline, and it's completely misleading. So I had to take the um, small small boat hydrographic data and then digitize all this environment and get a better b uh, bathymetry for that area to deal with. So that's the first issue that I'm dealing with. Um, second issue is Holocene sediments, which I don't get into in this particular model, but I'll get into later ones. Then um, I'm looking at relative climatic indicators. I was looking at changes in warmth and um, uh, changes in moisture and dune building and reef building in this area. So all of this kind of combined allowed me to have a broad um, environmental data set that dealt with shoreline changes and also environmental changes. So I went to um, this program called Terragen. Terragen is a 3D modeling software and they use it for um, uh, uh, big scale movies like Star Wars and you know, all of these things. They use it to create um, realistic and, uh, background green screen environments that look like real, real world situations. But um, the nice thing about Terragen is you can take existing data sets, GIS data sets, import them into the model and manipulate them in the model and create past environments or future environments in the modern topography. And you can use things like density of different plant species and all this kind of stuff to 
to simulate what are essentially realistic environments. So this is a mountain environment with pine trees and all that, completely simulated in Terragen with atmospheres and clouds and all that. That's a tropical one there. Um, so with Terragen, one of the things you have to bear in mind is in ArcGIS or in any other form of GIS, when you're dealing with uh, digital terrain, you're talking about the dis distances between um, data points. And in this case, we're dealing with 30 meter data points. So every point has an elevation value. And when you're, when you're interpolating that in three dimensional modeling, it creates this smooth surface. What Terragen does is it creates a 3D fractal interpolation of that. So it takes fractals and creates a rough terrain. And you can set the variation in that. So in, in all of these uh, modeling situations, I don't have the variation set any more than the difference between any two points. Anything in between can't be more than one and a half times that difference. So it's not massively different. It's, it's just interpolating a rough surface between them. And it makes it more realistic. When you get to things like modeling the ocean, you know, it creates a, a transparent surface that would, in which you can put things like this white shark model. 3D object, which I put under there. So this is a simulation of Dolphin Island in uh, Murajuga. And there's no vegetation on that island at all. But it looks very realistic compared to the photograph from the same area. When you get on the uh, ground level, then you're dealing with um, things like uh, plants, rocks, shells, sand. I've got three different sand layers in here. I've got a water surface. I've got three or four different kinds of rocks. I have terebralia shell, um, I have mangrove plants. These are four or five different uh, versions of mangroves. So you can get a very realistic on the ground kind of environment. And depending on where you have the camera looking from is how much um, photorealism uh, you put into it. So in this case, we wanted to look at um, a, uh, okay, so it's going. So this is an animation um, taken from about 200 kilometers above the Earth. And we're looking down at that same region. This uh, original animation was from 125,000 years ago till today. But this one is just showing the last 50,000 years. Um, that's the Murajuga region over there in this Barrow Island over here. And what you see is the shoreline going in and out based on those sea level curves. And the changes in coloration are reflecting about 23 or 24 different plant communities that I have distributed around the landscape using fractalization on top of that hydrology surface to simulate forest patterns and things like that. So this is showing the last four or five, 6,000 years um, until today. So uh, when you take individual um, frames from this time frame, you can see, um, which is kind of hard to see in this light, but um, you have uh, a snapshot of 50,000 years ago when it's pretty wet and heavily forested. About 20,000 years ago, it was very dry and, and grasslands. Uh, 10,000 years ago, the shoreline is coming in very rapidly. Um, there's no reef building at that time, and you have a lot of erosion going on. Uh, 8,000 years ago, um, the island islandization is starting to form here in the Murajuga area. About 4,000 years ago, it's almost the same as today. So. That was looking at this satellite view and, and the transition over time. And what was really interesting for the archaeologists is understanding where sites might have been located at different times in the past. Now, I did some slight modifications with uh, geomorphology on that, that one, but that was kind of an early one. And it's using essentially the modern bathymetry, even though I've modified it a little bit with a more higher resolution version. Uh, when we look at some ground level views, um, I set up three cameras, uh, one here, one there, and one there, on different, in different places around um, this region. And I created ground level visualizations for each of these locations looking in those directions um, as landscapes for these different time frames. So this is the shoreline of Modern Barrow uh, Island at 50,000 years ago. It would have been this open eucalypt forest with um, a lot of understory plants. Um, offshore from Rosemary Island, we have a denser, a little bit more dense um, eucalyptus forest. Um, it still is pretty wet at this time. The ridge line on the Burrup Peninsula, and we're looking at uh, forested areas pretty far off in the distance. When we get to um, 20,000 years ago, it's a lot drier. 
the top it's, it's this grassland environment. There's a skeleton of a thylacine over on the right that I inserted as well. Um, this is a rocky, um, rocky area offshore of Rosemary Island and the Burra Peninsula. You can see the rocks exposed here. These rocks on Marijiga are about 2 billion years old. When you get to about 8,000 years ago, it's a little bit wetter, not quite as wet as it was 50,000 years ago. But you start to see a much more dense um, a bunch grass kind of environment with these um, white, uh, I forget what, kind of, the white eucalyptus. And offshore, for, offshore from Rosemary Island, the shoreline's only about two kilometers from here at this time. And you start seeing these dunes. And today there's a lot of dunes in Western Australia that are very similar to this. And um, when you get to the ridge line of Burr Peninsula, it's starting to look a little bit more like it does today. Here's the same views from 4,000 years ago. You can see the shoreline is coming in at the top. Um, offshore from Rosemary Island, it's already inundated, but it's still pretty shallow. And you have this mangrove forest, which is growing there. And um, a little bit drier on the ridge lines. You can see some of the um, highly um, numerous uh, rock art that's um, uh, on the Murajuga uh, rocks. This is actually a photo of a real um, a piece of rock art that I just pasted onto that rock. And uh, when you look at, this is about 200 years ago. So we're looking at, there's a, a sailing ship in the distance on that one. But this is a, approximately where the shoreline is today on, on Barrow Island. Offshore on Rosemary Island, it's about uh, two to three kilometers offshore. You get a sea turtle uh, floating there. And in the Burra Peninsula, you start to see this encroachment of the mangroves in the distance. So when, uh, for the Western Australian Museum, they asked me to put together um, 3D immersive environments of this. So right now, this is just a, um, a video of me clicking through the five time periods um, from that center uh, camera from offshore on Rosemary Island. So that was 50,000 years ago. This is 20,000 years ago. And um, these are full 360, fully immersive um, uh, still pictures. But these could be made into animations as well. And you could make them three virtual reality um, kinds of visualizations. So that's, that's essentially um, where um, I kind of finished up with the Murajuga project. There's a shoal of fish there. Um, be nice if I I made them moving, but yeah, they're just <laughs> static in this view. They'd be easy to catch there. Um, and there's the sea turtle. So that's what it looks like today. Um, the next project I was going to talk about is um, some excavations we did in April of this year. Uh, this is the Vietnam Maritime Archaeology Project. We excavated a site called Dong Choi. This is on Quan Lan Island in Vietnam. And this is a Neolithic cemetery about 5,000 to 3,000 years ago. And we were doing test excavations. And it was a GPR project, too. So we were doing GPR uh, where we could at this site. Um, the 3D modeling time range uh, that I'm uh, going to show you pictures of is about 10,000 years ago to today. Uh, so this was a great project um, to work on. It's out, just outside of Halong Bay, so it was beautiful to get there. We had great food, uh, great people, nice cows. Um, did some GPR and some really uh, nice temple areas. But uh, this is the location. This is the Van Don District in Quang Ninh Province. Uh, Halong City is here. This is Halong Bay. That's by Tulong Bay. And Quan Lan Island is this long, narrow one right on the outside. So the data set I used for this is um, a bathymetry and topography of the Gulf of Tonkin. And um, it's pretty much on the same level as the Australian data set, where you have, you have very good topographic data. It's 30 meters or less. Um, but when you get to the bathymetric data, um, the, really the best bathymetry you can get is every 90 meters or so. And, um, a lot of that is, is pretty coarse. And when you get into the shallow waters, you don't have a lot of, um, a lot of information on what's Holocene sediments and what's Pleistocene sediments. So um, modeling where the shoreline actually was 
is pretty complex. So here in this image, we're sh the darker blue is 10 meters, 10 meters or more below um, sea level, modern sea level. The middle blue is um, between 4 to 10 meters. And then the lighter blue is 0 to 4 meters of uh, depth. So when you get into Halong Bay, it's saying everything is 0 to 4 meters. But there's a lot more deep, um, uh, deep bathymetry in there. It's just we don't have a lot of detail on it. Um, on Kwanlan Island itself, uh, the Dong Choi site is in red, and the hatched white areas are um, stabilized Holocene dune deposits. So with this site, I was really concerned about modeling where, what the environment was like for the site over a long period of time in this kind of very unstable um, dune situation. What we were finding at the site was um, a lot of ceramics. We had literally millions of ceramics that came out of two test pits. These, these two test pits are two by two meters, and those are um, photogrammetry 3D models of the test pits uh, during excavation. So what we had was um, the red line is one of the test pits, and the blue line is the other one. And uh, this is the depth on the side, which you can't read. But uh, what it's showing is that there's a lot of deflation in the site. The dunes have been, uh, they've had blowouts, and uh, all of the ceramics have collapsed into layers that are only about 10, 10 to 15 centimeters thick. And they're essentially a ceramic pavement. It was almost nothing but ceramics coming out of there. And there's no, there was no faunal material. There's no domestic material. There's some fragmentary human bones in these deflated areas. Um, and portions of the site are less deflated. The, on the blue line, for example, shows there's less deflation going on in the center portion of the site. And these are, are similar kinds of vessels that we think um, were being uh, placed on this site over several thousand years. And when we look at um, an aerial image, this was a drone aerial image that we took, um, the GPR grids that I did up in this area really show that, in fact, these are the test units we were doing. This one is highly deflated. This one is moderately deflated. Uh, when we get into GPR grid three, uh, two, three, and four, we can see that um, grid two, it looks like there's much less deflation going on. And this is an area that was recently cleared of mature forest. So we think that where the mature forest is in this quadrant of the site, um, it's been stabilized more for a longer period of time, and there's probably less deflation going on. When you look at GPR grid three, you can sort of see how all of those layers have been compressed. Um, so I started recreating this environment about 10,000 years ago. This uh, sea level is um, 38 meters below uh, modern sea level. The red circle is where the site is. Um, in this environment, I've um, estimated about 10 to 12 meters of Holocene sediment, and I've taken it out of the model. So in Terragen, I can create a displacement surface which eliminates all of that. It just takes it out and um, simulates uh, a, uh, an, a surface where it hasn't been deposited yet. So around 8,000 years ago, shoreline, the shores uh, or sea level is coming in. It's about 10 meters below um, modern sea level. And as the sediments are coming in, the sediments are being added with the shoreline itself, or with the ocean here. And it's, it's essentially created a, a bay, an embayment in here, and possibly some islands or something. Um, by around 7,000 years ago, there's this um, um, very strong offshore wind, which is creating these, these long linear dunes. And saltation is causing the creation of dunes in the back, ba uh, back beach areas. And at this time, the site was probably on this kind of knoll of, of sand dune. Or the, sand, the site hasn't been created yet, because it's still a couple thousand years before that. So 5,000 years ago, about the si same, time uh, same time frame, they may have started building this uh, or putting these uh, uh, ceremonial burial urns in the site. Um, the dunes are stabilizing. Vegetation has stabilized the ones in the interior. The only active ones are kind of along the shoreline. And um, it's a wetter environment. Um, vegetation has taken over, and it, it's kind of holding the dunes down. Um, by around 3,000 years ago, uh, it's gotten drier. Vegetation is dropping off, and the dunes are starting to erode. So in this model, the dunes that I had coming in they're now being eroded in the Terragen model. 
and also um, some of the early rice fields were starting to crop up 3,000 years ago too. So by about 1,000 years ago, we have um, village development, village formation, and one of the peaks of rice production. So the lighter green areas are rice fields. And these rice fields are actually uh, modeled in the aerial photography. Um, by around um, 20 years ago, uh, the rice fields, there's no longer any rice planting on the island. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, salted, salted in now. They stopped planting rice almost 50 years ago. That was another peak production time frame. And um, now all of these rice fields are just abandoned, um, kind of marshy deposits in some, uh, some places. But um, sand mining is coming in, and it's starting to encroach in this area. Um, and also, uh, the village's populations are much larger on this part of the island. This is an uh, aerial image from five years ago. So they cut a highway through here in 2011. And um, it's because of uh, uh, one of the archaeologists who stopped. Uh, they got a flat tire in their car, and they found some of the ceramics alongside the road. That's why the site was actually identified in 2016. So today, it's also a modern cemetery. So it's had this continuity of 5,000 years of being used as a cemetery, uh, possibly with abandonment in, in between. But this 3D model kind of helps us visualize um, the difference between what the terrain was 10,000 years ago and what it is today. So uh, the third project I was going to talk about is this one where we did, um, we had a grant from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training to look at 3D modeling at uh, the Point Reyes Peninsula. We finished this up uh, last year, and what we looked at was 20,000 years, 18,000 years ago into the past and 2,000 years into the future. <coughs> and so we're focused uh, mostly on Point Reyes um, National Seashore, but also the region around it. So this is um, a 3D visualization uh, looking out um, from Chimney Rock I set this about 100 years ago because I didn't put the lighthouse in this one. But there's about 16, 15, 16 different plant species in the foreground. And um, all of the vegetation layers are um, taken from the uh, Park Service's GIS database. So it takes that and it builds on it using this fractal um, interpolation. So one of the things to uh, think about in this area is unlike Australia and Vietnam, we have really, really good bathymetry, probably some of the best in the world in San Francisco Bay. And we have um, bathymetric LIDAR data up to um, two to three miles offshore. Uh, once you get farther than that, you're interpolating a little bit of, uh, of more coarse bathymetric data. But what I was concerned about was, all right, can we identify what the Holocene sediments are and what the thicknesses of them are in this area? And um, when we look at past attempts to model the shoreline change in California over time, people are using modern bathymetry. And we have to get away from that because it's not modern bathymetry we want to know, it's Pleistocene bathymetry. So um, San Francisco Bay has some really good data on the thicknesses of the Bay mud, the Holocene mud, and um, the soils data um, on the topographic areas also we have some pretty good data on thicknesses of Holocene sediments there as well. I put those together and then the offshore sediments, uh, the models mostly indicate uh, that Holocene sediments go up to about um, 60 meters deep or so on the continental shelf. Once you get off the continental shelf, you have up to 500 or more meters of Holocene sediment. But uh, the first thing I did was model all of that in the GIS and then subtract it from the modern topography to create, or the modern bathymetry, to create what the Pleistocene bathymetry might have been like. Additionally, I had to create a Pleistocene um, terrain model for the, for the existing topography. And this is the modern um, terrain over on the right. Um, on the left, we had to model all of that cliffs, uh, cliff face erosion that's occurred since um, sea level pretty much stabilized around 5,000 5, years ago or so. Um, all of that eroded shoreline had to be modeled back in. So we digitized all of that, um, estimating about how much, it was about a kilometer or more of sea cliff has eroded since about seven or 8,000 years ago. 
So that was all put back into the model. So we're using this Pleistocene bathymetry and Pleistocene topography for um, uh, modeling different things in the Point Reyes area. One of the things we wanted to look at was connectivity and mobility. So um, we looked at, uh, I did a caloric model of um, moving across this environment, north to south, um, south to north, east to west, west to east, from corner to corner, back and forth, and then all, add all this up um, and average it, and you get this um, relative ease of travel or a connectivity value for every pixel in your model. So the brown areas are easy to travel across, the blue areas are harder to travel across. This is the Pleistocene model, so the shoreline, the ocean is way out here, it's not on this square area. And the one on the right is the modern area, or the modern terrain, so the shoreline, or the ocean is the bluish area there where it's harder to travel across the ocean, not that, not that it's, um, hard to row, row a boat, but you have to expend all the energy to build the boat and the number of people are rowing it and all that as well. It's easier to walk across the orange terrain. So um, when we take that into consideration, we can do things like least cost paths. And this, these are least cost paths from um, the Petaluma River watershed to um, the shoreline. So these are paths we would expect people during the Pleistocene or the early Holocene to have taken through this terrain. And in the later Holocene, this, these are the paths we would expect people to take. And when you clip that to the modern maps of uh, Point Reyes, then you would see that if you're looking for the older sites, you'd expect them to be more within the reddish, the brown, orangish areas and less in the blue. And the more recent sites, you'd expect them to be the same over here. So you have these these um, potential um, components which can be added to a predictive model and used to help predict where you might encounter sites or what, where they might be in danger. So one of the first animations we did was looking at um, the whole region from 18,000 years ago um, with a cooler, uh, wetter climate um, up to 2,000 years into the future. And so every frame in this animation is 100 years. And you see the shoreline, shoreline coming in. As the shoreline comes in, the Holocene sediments are added as, as it grows. And uh, they're only added below um, the actual ocean uh, topography, so it's not being added you know, where it hasn't inundated yet. And um, the climate is changing with the green and brown. It, when it's brown, it's drier. And uh, these colors, um, again, this is using like uh, 32 or something different um, vegetation layers. <coughs> you can see San Francisco Bay building up there. Um, and it's showing uh, the sea level depth and also the plus or minus degrees centigrade versus today. And um, so you can see San Francisco Bay gets pretty large. Then there's a time period um, starting around 6,000 years ago where it starts getting drier and you have less sediment going into the bay, or you know, it starts getting wetter, so you have more sediment going into the bay and it starts um, decreasing in size. So when we think about the growth of San Francisco Bay, it's not this linear sort of, it just gets bigger and bigger until it hits modern. It actually gets bigger and then it gets smaller again and then it gets bigger again, um, depending on the kind of uh, processes that are going on. And this is the creation of the, the San Francisco sand dunes um, on the peninsula there as well. So this is about when we get to the modern time frame, I've got just gray coming in representing urban areas. And then we have shoreline um, uh, or sea level rising. And um, when we get to about 2,000 years from now, I've, this is pretty conservative. I only have an eight meter sea level rise on this. And Point Reyes has turned into an archipelago here. And that also includes erosion of the cliff line, which you can't really see um, at that small scale. So this is, um, this is the model of San Francisco Bay, just uh, shown obliquely looking um, from the south towards the north. So this is at 14,000 years ago. You can see it's starting to, to get a little bit uh, warmer. Um, the greens are getting a little bit brighter green, a little bit more yellow in there. By 11,000, 10,000 years ago, there's the shoreline coming in. <clears throat> so 
And this is only, uh, this only goes up until today. So this doesn't go into the future. I have another one that goes into the future though. So you can see it gets bigger and then it gets smaller again. And then it gets bigger again. And there it is. So at the it's only the last couple of frames where urbanization has kind of taken off. So when we look at um, some of the future, let's see if we can run. Yeah, okay. So this is this is the Point Reyes Peninsula eroding um, from today until 2,000 years from now. So if you're able to stand in the same place looking at the, this peninsula for 2,000 years, this is what you're going to see. And then this is San Francisco Bay. I've got the areas being inundated in pink um, as they come in. So this is from today until about 400 years from now, possibly. So <laughs> big areas are going to be gone. Um, so the thing to bear in mind with this is um, in Terrigen, I use different erosion models. And the erosion models can be um, very similar even uh, over the same time, or be very different even over the same time frame. This is uh, looking on South Beach at Point, uh, Point Reyes today with modern topography. I've taken out everything except one vegetation layer just to keep it sort of uh, fairly consistent. Um, this is the same erosion model applied for 200 years in both situations. And you have um, sand is being eroded or sediment is being eroded off of the uplands and into the ocean. But there's two different sand uh, transport mechanisms offshore here. This is a weak one and that's a strong one. So depending on how much shore, uh, um, long shore current you have moving sand away, it can make a very different um, environment. In this case, you actually have the extension of beaches going out. And then in that situation, you have a retraction of beaches. So there's still a lot of complexity involved in all of these uh, hydrodynamic forces. And the thing that's good about Terrigen is you can experiment with different techniques of, of visualizing this. So this on the right is showing the um, eroded, the black areas and the depositional areas, which are blue to green on this 200 year erosion surface. So you can see where things are actually moving more. In this case, I've just thrown a bunch of virtual measuring rods on that environment so you can see in any particular location where sediment is building up or where it's being um, subtracted. So the ground level visualizations, um, I set a camera offshore looking toward Point Reyes, um, the, the cliff face where the um, lighthouse is, and um, set this one at 18,000 years ago. And so you have things like Blackberry in the foreground um, you have a variety of, of uh, Douglas fir and um, um, Sitka spruce and other trees that were on in this area at the time with the right grasses and everything. So there's about um, 10 or 12 different plant species scattered around the, in this environment. Um, here's the same location um, at 10,000 years ago. So the forest is retreating, the shoreline is, come, is moving in, you're getting this open grassland here and things like um, stream channels uh, eroding down to the ocean. By around 7,000 years ago, you have active erosion of um, the cliff faces here um, and collapse of trees into the, into the ocean, for example, and the thinning of the, the Douglas fir forest um, so that it's, uh, it's a little bit drier. Um, by 3,000 years ago, the shoreline has moved back quite a bit, and you start getting these larger cliff faces that uh, we see at Point Reyes now. Um, here's what that same view looks like today, or about 100 years ago, because the lighthouse is like right here. And um, this is about 2,000 years from now. So that would be a little island um, in that archipelago. So that's just the very remnants of that big formation that we know is Point Reyes. And um, just for fun, we also modeled around uh, Marin County. We looked at some of the population areas and 
modeled. Um, currently, the new climate forecast models are, are projecting as much as eight feet of sea level rise in the next 100 years and a loss of 8% of the forested habitat. So we did these visualizations. This is Sausalito today, and this is 2119, where the color code shows from red to purple, one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot inundation. So everything that's colored would be inundated. So some of the shoreline of Sausalito would be gone. Not too bad there. This is Corte Madera. That's gonna be gone. <laughs> Um, that includes the highway, which goes across it. So um, within the next 100 years, we're going to have to solve that issue about, you know, how are people going to, is it going to be a bridge going across that area or, or what? This is um, San Rafael. A um, lot of industrial area is going to get completely inundated. This is Terra Linda. So that's... Fairly, fairly rural in general right now. Uh, this is Novato. Novato is going to be a little peninsula sticking out over there. So if you have a house in Novato or buy a house over there, not, not down in the flat areas. Um, this is Point Reyes Station. So currently you can look out and see the little Point Reyes Station and you see uh, Tamales Bay there and the stream going into it. Tamales Bay is going to be a lot larger, and that stream is going to be a lot, um, a lot higher as well. Um, conversely, when you look at Drake's Bay, for example, there's actually really not a whole lot of effects going on over there. Um, there's some inundation, but uh, it's mostly archaeological sites which are going to be, be affected there, and natural habitat, of course. And that's Stinson Beach. It's also um, it's mostly areas that are still fairly low right now that would be affected. So ultimately, that's, that's a quick, quick overview of um, the geospatial research and 3D modeling that uh, I've been doing lately within the last few years. And the main emphasis on this is that the Earth's surface is not static. Uh, we can't use modern topography to measure this. We have to build in these um, dynamic geomorphological models into how we can measure where terrain actually was in the past and where it's likely to be in the future. Those uh, models of inundation in Marin County, they're still, they're using the modern terrain. So what you have to consider is that over the next hundred years, as the first foot erodes, it's going to be a different terrain model for the second foot and for the third foot and the fourth. So it's actually going to be kind of exponential. It's not going to be as simple as I made it um, there. So it's something that we still have to take into consideration um, that uh, we can use for a lot of the modeling that we do. So if you have any questions, you can send me an email, uh, or we still have a few minutes here. Thanks. Sure. I'll just remind people that next Wednesday, we'll have Doug Bailey from uh, San Francisco State, who uh, has a Bailey topic, art slash archaeology, colon, a space beyond explanation, dash, the ineligible project. So next week. Anyway, now I'll turn back to Tom, who will entertain questions that people need to filter out. Filter. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, are some of these animations available online for like showing in the classroom? Uh, yeah, I have a bunch of them on uh, a YouTube channel that I have. Okay. Yeah. What's the name of that channel? It's just under my name. Oh, okay. <laughs> Search on my name, you can find it. Um, and there's, there's, I don't know, 15 or 20 different animations there. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was very impressive. Um, and I wanted to ask you, besides the Star Warsian software, collecting the, the, or, you know, sort of the environmental data, you talk about the thumb tree, that yeah. if you're not right on the sea, if right. you're just doing topography, where, I mean, how much of this, did you have to model, and how much did you sort of get from modelers? And uh, where did those it's, models of the terrain? Yeah, come it's from? mostly it's mostly me modeling it, and like for all of these, uh, for everything you see with the bathymetry, it's very fairly straightforward. All the climatic information, it's about forty or fifty different references that I have to pull together all this different information. The wetter, drier, wetter, dr wetter, drier, moisture, um, less uh, drier. Um, plant species, 
Um, and I can tell you, it's pretty hard. <laughs> it's pretty hard to find a lot of these, especially when you start getting into the Vietnam data, because you know a lot of it's in Vietnamese, and um, I have to rely on Vietnamese colleagues to put it together or other sources. Um, luckily, we well, did I'm have. Asking yeah, that because I'm working with a modeler from Mexico on modeling sort of Mex central Mexico with a little bit of Florida, that kind of swatch. Yeah, yeah. To look at environments that are appropriate for certain plant species. Right. So that we can try and plot the wild um, taxa of cats, cats come. Yeah. And where they would be growing through time. And we did 20,000, 10,000. Um, and he did then 4,000 and today. Yeah. And I want that 8,000. Right. Because that's when I think people are going to be really engaging with those right. plants. And he just keeps saying he can't do it. He doesn't yeah. have. So I'm asking you, where do you get the, these data? That, why can this modeler not? Well, I'm also fudging a bit, too, because when you look at the vegetation models, um, I'm using pre existing 3D models um, from gaming uh, sites or pe people who trade 3D models. And for example, the blackberry in the Point Reyes one, that's a Himalayan blackberry that's in there. <laughs> but I know it's supposed to be California blackberry, but you can't really tell the difference between the two <laughs> in the model. Or if I can, I can actually change it, so I think the difference visually is um, both sides of the leaf are green on California blackberry, where it's, it's a lighter color on Himalayan huckleberry. I can actually go in and change those colors, so I can, I can Modify an existing model to be one that I want it to be. You did all the reading of these I had to do all of the, yeah. About each taxon yeah. And, the elevation. and there's a point where I have to cut off and just yeah. say, I'm yeah. guessing for some of this. Um, because some of it you can't really tell from the visualization. So, yeah. Nico. Um, you mentioned that 6,000 years ago the sea level for the bay was sort of filled with, with less water than <clears> the uh, yeah, that may, it may, may have been starting around 6,000 years ago. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly where it was, but around 4,000 years ago, I think it was the driest it was, was prehistorically. Uh, the implications for shell mound formation along the bay? Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe they were elongated, so people might have you know, pursued the water down to get. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it's it possible. Because when you're looking at the formation of the bay, you also have to think about, all right, so where's the, um, where's the fresh water coming in, and where's the salt water coming in, and where is it mixing? So, and where is it rocky, and where is it sandy? So those are going to be huge factors in determining which shellfish species are where, and where their shorelines are, and how fast they're moving. Because um, as they're coming in, especially in the last 10,000 to 5,000 years ago, shoreline's moving really fast, so you get this erosion of shoreline, especially in that Australia model, it's very flat. So you have um, single seasons where people might have gone to the shoreline, they come back the next year, they've lost more than 150 meters of shoreline um, in some places. So um, in some situations, it's moving so fast, it's not amenable to um, shellfish. Um, it's the same thing with the reef building. Um, when the sh uh, sea level is rising more than, I think it's like an inch and a half uh, or a uh, centimeter and a half every 10 years or something, um, the, c the coral doesn't get enough sunlight to build up, so the reefs aren't building. So it's not until it slows down. So we had to take all of that into consideration and build that into the model. I know some of the reefs aren't showing up in the, in the animations, but it's something to bear in mind when we're talking about where the archaeological sites are going to be. I'm curious to see um, in your um, point ways modeling, um, forest density um, seemed um, about 5,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago. Yeah. How do you decide? Um, um, that, yeah, that's reading a lot of the literature saying, OK, these are the species that are there. These yeah, species the tend to be, yeah. Very and um, the density, there's, there's a few sources where they talk about the density of the forest. Okay during those time frames and how it probably cleared out. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't take into consideration um, Native American right. fire management yeah. systems. That that's, that's something that we did not include in this model, but we'd, we'd like to do that. We're, I'm writing a grant to do the same thing at um, the Channel Islands and also in the Mojave, um, Mojave Desert area, recreating these environments. 
And, but at some place like Point Reyes, that fire management system is really important. I talked about it in my California prehistory class, but it's not included in this model, but it's something that you can include because you can, you can have variations and say, this is the density I want for this animation and this is the density I want for this one and see how they're different. I just ran it that one way. Have you ever um, played with vegetation feedbacks to erosion or moisture dynamics? That would be really complicated. Yeah. It seems that you're very well set up to explore that. Yeah, that's something. Uh, in Terrigen, I have a, an erosion model that I can play with a lot of parameters, but feedback from vegetation is not one of them. So it's a little bit too simplistic. And um, uh, there's other ways you can add in displacements or things like that that may reflect that. But it's something that I don't really have enough background in to be able to do it. But it's something that would be really useful for people who do want to model that. That's it? OK. OK, well, uh, let's thank uh,